All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, things are getting a little more somber. Heads up on you guys that are coming a few weeks uh, after Italy and China and so forth. Um, yeah, I just went to walk Kalele out. And as I was about to, first of all, last night, <laughs> I went to walk the dog and they were spraying the street with something I was all concerned about my plants of course um but then I smelt it and it's I was concerned about Kalele too of course um and they, I, I couldn't make it inside the house and uh I, I wanted to I wanted to sneak in beside next because it was occupying the whole street the little truck and it was right in front of my door and I was trying to get in before I would have had to wait a whole you know whatever however long and the guy was coming towards me with a spray gun. And so I had to um, go around the other way and wait. But yeah, this morning I smelt it and it was just like um, a, a, a drop of, of bleach in water. So it wasn't so bad. And of course they wouldn't spray anything too terrible. Um, so close to people. But anyways, uh, yeah, this morning I was, we also went for a little walk and um, two hearse came down which is kind of a big deal. And there were people waiting outside. I guess they knew that they were going to be, um, you know, carred out of the town. Uh, but I didn't know that until I saw them actually come down and probably people they knew. And it was two, one after the other. So I don't know. For um, It could have been a couple, but for, for Orte, it's kind of a big deal because there's only, up here in this part of town, in the old part of town, there's only... Um, I don't know if 500 people was probably too much. There's hardly anybody lives up here. Everybody lives down where the newer buildings are and the subdivisions out around. And, um, so yeah, I'm, I made a, I made some videos in Turney yesterday. Uh, and they're probably, I went on my little sociolo sociology, political police, judicial system rampage. And, but actually there's, they're not so bad compared to my my boring monologues inside my room. So I'm going to edit those for those who are interested. I, I think I got together a few points in the same rant <laughs> that work uh, towards getting the point across. So maybe some of you, perhaps John and other um, like-minded people might be interested in in, uh, in helping people that are... I've been... I was in jail for 25 days once completely on a lie on something that did not happen as per accusation um you know there was a moment of like, exaltation violence and shouting and were uh, at home where i was staying with my mom in her place but it never got to any kind of striking or hitting anybody uh and yet my mom who was suffering Alzheimer's and then her maid who was conditioned to lie all the time, you know, lie to um, bill collectors and whoever, you know, she was instructed to tell the police that I had hit her and my mom did this, I think, well, whatever, she's old and um, she didn't think that it would, or maybe she actually didn't care, which is a whole sad story, that it could result in you getting thrown in jail for a while by California law. Uh, two women can agree on saying something, and it's, it's as if it were evidence. And obviously there was no evidence. There was no, not a scratch or anything on my mother. And the story that I later, uh, in the holding station, uh, was telling was absolutely sensible if they had wanted to believe and understand what possibly the reality actually was. But these investigators... They, they were just so bent on making a case that they created a story about me being a certain character type of person. And I was, you know, luckily it was all dismissed because they, the judge was somebody else, a lady, uh, a woman, you know, with experience, a uh, grandmother probably, who had a, it wasn't like this, uh, this angry, um, I don't want to start with races and, you know, but anyways who believed whatever the police was telling them. This was a lady who just took a minute and looked at my mother and said, 
hmm, there's something funny here. This, you know, she probably thought this looks like the kind of person who'll just say anything to the police, be capricious and a little neurotic and looks like she's getting too old. And so she went and asked her a few questions in front of the whole courtroom, said, do you, do you want your son to be by your side? And my mom just lit up and of course, of course I want my, you know, and so the judge went, wait a second, supposedly this woman wants a restraining order? No, the restraining order was created by the police department, not by my mother. Uh, and she made another question and uh, do you want your son to take care of you? Instantly she lifted the restraining order, she dropped the felony, you know, and phew, I was able to have a better record on that lie that the police had constructed. In any case, while I was in county, I saw kids that were, you, you know, you almost, as, as somebody who's interested in psychology, you know that these are people that are not ruined, that you know that they're just still learning, still growing. I mean, the probably 17 18 year old, um, maybe not 17 because that would be underage, but these are people that look like they're teenagers and maybe they're 21 or 22. Uh, and, and, and thus, it's just a number. They're still growing. They're still trying to have a relationship to work out with their parents. They're still trying to prove themselves to their father or society. And, you know, the, the, the psychological sophistication of our law system of our legal system is completely ridiculous it's it's sad it's it's in another <laughs> backwards era and they, it's because i would see these kids this one guy was given 17 years and he said did you kill him? i asked him you know you don't ask these kinds of questions at jail but somehow i got away with it did you kill anybody so no they they found guns and i was in the car with da 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 and you know, oh, so you actually didn't do anything. No, I was, you know, I, they gave him 17 years. That kid was um, in a car with somebody and maybe was running around with a little posse. But, you know, the reality of that is that maybe he just didn't have a family that made him feel like he was worth anything. And so these are natural human um, forces of our, of our of our natural psychology we're completely brutal. We have no sophistication in understanding the human mind and what we need, what needs to be nurtured, how to heal, how to get somebody through a, 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 a social situation that is detrimental and, and put them on a healing track of their uh, self-perception, perception of society. And so when I, I guess this period in, in county served me to, in fact, verify not to mention that I, I later was shared a hotel room, you know, because they send you out and they give you a voucher to stay in a hotel room for a day or something. Uh, this guy, this gay guy that was telling me <laughs> things that you would not believe. And I totally believed him I because I saw that, in fact, um, and this is also talked about, it's the drugs being administered by officers in county themselves, giving meth to, you know, anyways... Uh, it's hearsay. I'm not saying this happens, but the story that's the stories that would be told, that would be told about what is really what our penitentiary system is and what it really goes on and how the police actually act and treat uh, people who are maybe even innocent who are there for 20 days or a month or a year, and they weren't the ones, they really didn't do anything, but the system snags them in, and yet they have to suffer. I, for example, was punched in the nose uh, because innocent me, I mean, I grew up in West LA. What do you want? You know, I don't know how to how to shut up when, you know, I'm not saying, I wasn't confrontational. This guy wanted to, wanted my food so that he could, sell it, you know, in jail, there's like a little economic, uh, co commercial system of, of trading muffins and cheese and apples and shit, cigarettes. And so they, they all get tough and it becomes like their world. It's all about these, you know, having power over others and having them give them their food. And so this guy asked me to give him, give him some his food so he could do whatever across the wall. You can't see each other, but the next cell over. And I just, I wasn't being Bra uh, brave or anything. I, I just thought I didn't want to get snagged into that world. So I tried to pull back and said no in some kind of way. 
And this guy instructs my cellmate to punch me in the face. And my cellmate was so afraid that he... Did, I mean, this is nothing. This is just the tip of the iceberg. He punched me in the nose. And I started bleeding in, in my cell because, you know, and imagine... And this happens to one person. The stories that we don't hear about people getting... Um, raped at night, you know, and we think we laugh it off, we even talk about it in the news, as if it wasn't really happening, as if it was a novel we were reading, and people aren't really suffering torture in jail. How can we be so detached from what we subject our own citizens to is unbelievable. I mean, America is so horribly superficial about life. We don't care who suffers what, as long as I, I'm all right, you know. <sighs> what the hell? And some people are starting to finally, these last, this, I don't know how long the Innocence Project, has, but there are volunteers, but they're going against a, a massive tsunami, a counterforce that doesn't really let them even scratch the, the surface. So they've, and even so, they've released, I don't know how many hundred, how many hundreds of innocently, innocent uh, prisoners. People wrongfully accused that spend decades in jail who were not the ones who raped. Now, think about this. If with all the counter forces that these uh, volunteer practically groups of the Innocence Project, uh, uh, with all the forces that they have to battle against and the difficulties and everything is geared towards keeping people in jail, not looking to see if maybe the system made a mistake, they were able to release a thousand uh, innocent uh, prisoners, imagine, imagine how much injustice, innocence, over, over sentencing, brutal mischaracterization of, of situations that ended up giving years in prison to some, would, would, you would not punish anybody for what actually happened is actually going on. How do we get politicians to care about this. I, w I ask you, how do you believe we could actually get a politician to say, oh, well, maybe I'm the one that's supposed to do something about that in the country? How do we actually provoke that? Because I don't, I don't, obviously, uh, most of us feel impotent. We don't have enough of a, of so, enough social influence and enough activities in society to even say, well, I could do this. You know, some of us can do this. We can make these videos, and so we do that. But a, a video is nothing. <laughs> a video you can turn off. <laughs> like many of you probably turned this off before I even got to this this part. You know, it really can do nothing and potentially do nothing. So it is a, a huge matter of impotence. Um, but yet, it's the this virus outbreak is making a lot of people think actually look at us we get all crazy about and then you compare how many people die every year i mean it is terrible i just saw two people get carted out of town and and, and hearse uh but actually every year so many equally uh some some as many people get uh, die from other uh, diseases nothing really happens nobody is making sure that you know, that a certain ingredient is not in our food because that will 50% chance give you cancer by the age of 60. You know, nobody really looks at uh, it that way. Um, I'm kind of losing track of what I was saying here. Um, oh, yeah. Well, basically, the reason, and I've written about this already, and I'm, maybe this will answer the question for a lot of people, Finally, the state, the news, or the politicians, the presidents, the governments are making a big deal about this is because, in fact, they were informed early on, uh, initially at the, at the start, I mean, uh, that given the characteristics of this virus, there will be, you know, wherever the country concerned, wh whichever the country concerned was, 10, a hundred thousand, possibly a million dead people in a few months, in three or four months, and so when they heard that, they realized, oh, and they and the people and the news, and they're going to start saying, 
you knew and you didn't do anything. So all of a sudden they care. Why? Because their position of power, political authority, uh, popularity and, and their uh, and their political environment and, uh, you know, their whole life was their own personal uh, survival situation in this world, their own reality, their own, the, it touched them personally, you see, it, that's all of a sudden, they made it something, but other situations, like for example, that so many people will get a certain type of cancer because of this chemical when they reach 60, is something that will never touch them, because that whole connection will never um, instantly abrupt uh, instantly abrupt instantly abruptly explode like um like it would if in three months all of a sudden there's twenty thousand dead people uh that will affect them but other things like hunger in africa hunger in our own country in countries there are that didn't know this thirty years ago now they have some children dying of hunger all of a sudden uh, I mean, that, see, that's interesting because, for example, in a country where uh, today we verified for the first time uh, so many, a few children died of hunger, the politicians cared, and all of a sudden it became hunger is our priority, our biggest problem, because of what I just explained. And yet, in situations where countries affect other countries in Africa and Asia and therefore blocking them and making diverting their interest towards international relations, international commerce, and not really worrying about their own uh, um, starving children. And, and there's three million people at least in a given year that will die of hunger at the beginning of a year. I actually don't know the year. I just learned... Um, through one of these great internet sites so far this year about three million people so that's you know times that times three have died of hunger and why do we not why, why don't politicians react the same way it's other human beings because it, it will never explode in something that will affect their own personal standing ever it will always be something talked about as a uh, Oh, we got to understand why this is happening, polemics, and, and well, does it concern us or not? It doesn't touch them ever. So they don't care. They don't react. We let it continue on. We did it, we've been letting that continue on forever. Now, if all of a sudden, uh, for example, let's say, I don't know, the president of a country was made directly responsible for uh, uh, a country that became its colony, Let's say, and so that that is a big issue. You know, they're the they're the ruling country of, let's say, the Falklands, for example. And all of a sudden, um, people, kids started starving in the Falklands. It would directly affect the the, the government in London. So um, people would all of a sudden, oh yeah, well we better do some jump on that and not let it happen because the the communication, the the, the way. Um, the, the the way the news would would come about in the world is uh, through a way through a setup that immediately involves their responsibility the the the, spe the responsibility of specific people possibly in London regarding that small colony and so uh, it would become news and they would do something about it right away so you see this is what um, the this and this uh, COVID-19 epidemic is teaching us that it's actually shining a light through, uh, through fabric that is covering a lot of structures that we never think about. And it's doing so many amazing things. Like, for example, and you watch the way things are compiled on the news, like um, um, uh, there were – somebody was showing – a, series, uh, a sequence of of Trump a month ago or whenever saying, oh, this is nothing, you know, this is just um, only, it's going to fly over and, you know, we'll, we're handling it and whatever he said, right? And I was watching that excerpt. I was actually watching it a month ago. And I remember how I felt. And I have to admit that even with my critical perspective, 
there's a part of me of any human being that wants to believe in your leader, wants to believe in leaders, wants to believe that we we can do this, we can we got this, you know, we can fix it. And so his words, though one is cynical and says he's lying, he's lying, he's lying, even still you kind of well, it looks like it may not be that bad just because of the way he was saying it. And then when I saw this com- compilation of, of of how that whole that whole process changed and the following week he changed and again i remembered how i was also captured by uh, some some degree of wanting to believe him uh, on that second week and then i see while i'm watching this compilation how i feel now i felt like i was lied to i felt like i I i'm a fool like what an idiot it, it all of a sudden made Politicians really seem like human, human in the sense that they lie. They lie to get out of the get out of the hot water. You know, they they basically say what they need to say really quickly to satisfy, you know, like somebody really mediocrely, really um, uh, ineptly, inadequately. How can I say this? Uh, made them look really fall, uh, fallible, human. Uh, a, a capable of lying without even being able to control, you know, when you're so desperate to get out of a situation that you start lying and you don't realize, you don't really intend to, you don't plan on lying, but you you start a path of of wanting to sound positive and before you know it, you're lying. Um, that way, you know, they really, and I saw them small all of a sudden. So, and this is all happening because of this epidemic that is sweeping the world um we are able to and and it all has to do and i'll I'll wrap it up now this all has to do with the explosion of communications with which is actually wonderful it's that the world is starting to like it was like the world was a big ball that had no mouth but it had eyes and now all of a sudden it's evolving a mouth and it's starting to say i am doing this i think this collectively as a world and it's an amazing opportunity for us to finally evolve into a collective species that really thinks of itself first as collectively of course we're not nobody's seeing that yet we're, it's desperating a lot of people who are feeling threatened and they're trying to control the internet they're trying to censor they're trying to give privileges you know um i was watching a documentary last night that was uh, called Alpha Go, Alpha Go, which is a documentary about a competition. It, I recommend it. I've shared it on Facebook. Um, and there's a part in it um, that the people who designed Alpha Go were saying, yes, the whole polemics of artificial intelligence is arising. And we're questioning if uh, it, there's a, we could go over a threshold where we won't notice that it can start harming us. That you know, um, that it will that it will get out of our hands. That it will be something we will slowly start uh, uh, damaging society, the world, lives, and and we won't have done anything about it. And so, because this awareness is starting to um uh, uh you know come to the surface or or become an issue um they were saying where a lot of us are wondering are thinking if we should create like committees or agent uh what do you call it not agencies but okay let's just say committees uh that uh look at what the impacts are immediately and you know we're basically the beginnings of what would be uh, an authority of govern of of administration. So it's like the problem arises, and we're recreating our same problem. Uh, it was very interesting because who are the ones that decide if uh, artificial intelligence being uh, launched onto onto the world is ethically acceptable or not who are the people who, how do they decide it what are their their what's their criteria you know and and will they not also create situations of privilege of self convenience of self-servingness and the whole thing re- another scale of the same problem uh reoccurs again 
even in light of trying to anticipate a problem. Um, and what I realized was that as I was watching this documentary, I really recommend it because it, it's so analogous to uh, the evolution of human society um, throughout history. What I realized is that the one thing, because they were trying to figure out ways, and that's what really captures your imagination, of uh, anticipating the mechanisms of human reasoning so that the game would, have, the, the, the software would evolve itself. And so they, it competes against like the world champion of Go, right? And they, it beat him, it beat him badly. And then it, the European champion, and then it, it competed against the world champion. And um, it beat him the first game and then the second game again. And um, they were talking about how um, uh, uh, how they evolved this, this process. And it occurred to me, you know what? The one thing they don't consider, because in the game, what happens in a game in reality? In a game, when we're playing chess or Go or what have you, or backgammon, you're... Your um, part of your mind, yeah. There's strategy, logistic, and da 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 da. But we're all, all the time considering what the other person's going to do, right? And they would talk about how they try to factor that into the reasoning of the software uh, of its calculations. But in reality, when we are human beings are playing a game, you're assessing the emotionality also. There's something that motivates you. There's something that goes beyond logic that uh, plays into your decisions even uh, that has to do with how confident the other one is. And the whole emotional human that is uncalculable plays into your those decisions that will be made. And they may argue that they try to... Uh, you know, or God forbid that they actually try to create that into some kind of calculation because there is a place where calculations cannot reach. It's an area. It's like the never, never land of, of these kind. And that in itself is not seen as an element in, in, in these, these brilliant, super intelligent software develop, developers and humanity and human civilization does not still do not we, as a civilization, as, as human intelligence regarding society, thinking about society and the mechanisms of sociology and what have you, we don't uh, have not yet established that we are a collective first. And that means that we start on the other. We start on each other. In other words, what is thought by each one of us will have to do with our awareness and what we think and how whatever's going on with another. It's a place, it's a, it's a shared origin. And that shared origin gives is also where language starts, for example, where uh, words will mean what the, they mean and definitions will be what they are thanks to the agreement of two people, not because one will succeed in, in having that word mean that when they design a language, for example. But if it, the other person, let's say the person who designed Esperanto, um, does not agree, okay, yeah, that will mean house. That will mean house. I agree. And I too. And, and if the other person agrees that the definition for that sound will be house, then the language has a chance of succeeding. And so is everything else that we reason and understand about... Um, even uh, the development of software. And it was really sad. This documentary was awesome. It's really sad because there was a sign, there was something, there was a, a bit of hope. There was a, a moment of hope because everybody, at one point, everybody was feeling really uh, saddened that this computer was beating. And then, you know, the, the this boy, uh, this Korean guy spoke with a really, has a real high pitched voice, like a lady's voice, and spoke really high, and it just strung at your compassion, like he made you feel like he was a vulnerable guy, you know, uh, soft and mild mannered, and and um, and so the fact that this he got beat uh, twice, 
in a row everybody was kind of thrown off and they couldn't and and so that's what this documentary that's why it's such a good documentary it's because it it focuses on this emotional process and you know what i suspect i suspect that somebody uh because on this on the third game all of a sudden the computer started making odd mistakes and everybody was going whoa look at how imperfect the, the computer can't sort of an, create emotionality they didn't say it that way but um but what i suspect is that th there was a whole political aspect that wasn't really focused on in the documentary of uh because uh, obviously uh the, the the game company um uh, AlphaGo wants to succeed and sell their product and and the whole idea and the whole scientific uh, lobby of uh, of uh, developing this kind of software or technology uh, wants to succeed and wants to be well seen in the world so they were really interested in their computer beating the champion but at the same time uh you know it's really really interesting if even the world champion of all of history if if the world champion of this game were beat before the cameras of the world by artificial intelligence what would happen to the game would anybody even want to play it anymore so there was a moment in which they were saying wait maybe it's not the best thing that this guy loses who we won't have anybody else to play against because at first they 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 uh, decimated the European champion, and now they were playing against a South Korean guy who was a world champion. And uh, so the third game, something weird happens, and he, the computer starts acting kind of funny, and the guy wins. Or the fourth game, I'm sorry, the fourth game. And then the fifth game was kind of a tie, sort of he lost two, but he didn't. So there was a more, there was a message, there was an experience that was created. And so whoever... And this is my theory. Somebody messed and, and maybe didn't even tell the programmers did something, you know, something was done there. So because it seemed a little strange the way the three first games, he was beat. The, the world champion was beat mercilessly. And uh, the fourth game, all of a sudden it was like, whoa, it looked like somebody. And I think some of the programmers probably said, hey. That's not supposed to happen. <laughs> but they did this, and this is my theory. I'm not saying it actually happened. I may be wrong. But in any case, the the value of what happened remains. So that's why I'm thinking if somebody behind the scenes did this, maybe he was really wise and and he realized this was this needed to be done for the good of everybody. Uh because um the, the the player came out in fact as as they as they explained it the player came out a better person because his arrogance was was uh, watered down let's say by the but at the same time he won a fourth game so he he proved that he was as good as a computer and so he was able to continue his sport and and being the person but in a more uh, in a more valued way by people because he challenged a computer and then the and the, and the computer programming company or whatever it is they uh, were able to always also get theirs because uh, wow you know we're we're rising we're getting better and we're exploring we're helping humanity uh, process this de the development of this technology process or develop rather. Uh, uh, this technology. So, anyways, I really recommend it. But what I, what to me in my my personal area of interest was very interesting is that uh, we continue to be blind to the fact that we err, we make mistakes, uh, our because our intelligence is more than we can handle, and that's just a, a condition, a, a mixed blessing. And uh, something uh, and Achilles' heel that will never leave us, but to own it and to become a species that say, thinking that we can rule things by system, technologies, administration, governments, and succeed at it is naive and stupid. We will always fail in our inventions, and we will never. The way we, you know, it's. Uh, I. I uh, I need to develop this argument, but basically understanding uh, this at a very, very uh, differently, uh, 
at a very conceptual level will create an emotion, a completely different emotional discussion. In so far as, for example, uh, what we worry about in the development of artificial intelligence, uh, how we we word and how we structure our worries and what our concerns are, rather, uh, would change, would be different because we would have placed everything in the right place. Um, and we would have acquired some assurances that we don't have right now. And so we continue to run ahead in fear, trying to make sure that something, whatever, that that fear evolved into us uh, will not catch up with us. And so the logic behind the emotional discourse of, for example, artificial intelligence would be different to what it is right now. And anyways, that's what I, I know I didn't explain that but um, well at all, but this is the part that interests me about what that documentary uh, taught me last night. So I totally recommend it and see what I would love to see what you guys uh, felt was important or what it made you think about if you see it. All right. Stay well. Ciao.